Bruce Summers, welcome to Unmuzzled TV. We're here today for Sunshine Coast Unmuzzled, and uh, and we're here with Chris to kind of get a bit of a background on his story, and uh, and what happened with uh, with his situation. So, Chris, welcome, mate. Look, thanks for having me, mate. No, absolute pleasure. Law mowers in the background, but that's the nature of uh, of doing interviews in the street. That's it. So, mate, tell me the first thing I really want to understand: Has any media outlets actually approached you? about trying to find out, uh, getting a deeper understanding about all of this? Besides yourself, mate, nobody has. No media has come and approached me for anything. It's like they're not interested in the story, you know? So we've got, we've got, a, we've got a situation where obviously there's a lot of controversy about this. It's gone through the court. It didn't seem to pan out like the general public was expecting. Um, Coming back to, I mean, look, we're here today at the site of where the RBT happened. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how did it unfold? Well, look, everyone's seen the video that got posted on YouTube. It, it was just a normal day, you know. I was coming home from work. I was travelling down this road here, coming past, and the copper decided to pull me and five or six other cars in for what, what he calls a random breath test. Okay. So he walks up to you. You were the first in line, were you? Yeah, mate, I was. Okay, so he walks up to you and... We noticed your footage, and, uh, and and for the viewing public, we have also got a copy of the, the footage from the officer's lapel. The footage actually starts part way through the conversation. So obviously there was conversation before you started recording. Yeah, there was. Yeah, look, he pulled me over and he started to tell me, you know, you've been stopped for a random breath test, and immediately I just cut him off and I said, mate, I'm I under arrest, I'm afraid to go. Yeah. And it just continued from there. He, then he asked to see my driver's license and I explained to him that it's not my license, I don't own it. I did show it to him though to, to prove who I was. So that otherwise that was another charge they would have tried to lay on me. Yeah, yeah. So to kind of, to, the whole idea of this is to drill down into this issue and kind of explain it to the public. There's a lot of things being said. First and foremost, do you think people should just be able to drive around drunk, get away with it? Not at all, mate. Look, I'm 100% against drink driving. And I do think that we need drink driving laws. We need things like breath tests on the side of the road. Yeah. But we also need the police to follow proper due process. Okay. And, and that, they need to use the authority which they're given in the correct way. Okay. So, look, this is something that we'll get to later on in terms of the legitimacy of random breath testing laws. I think that much has been made public through the mainstream media that you can test the legitimacy of the laws upon which the police reply, uh, rely upon. That's right. But for today, and coming back to this, this kick-off moment here on the roadside, there's a couple of things we've noticed that seem to raise more questions than they answer. So you were pulled up with three or four other cars. We noticed in the footage there's a motorbike in the background. Now, did the police officer you know, you were arguing with him, okay? So you're an obstructive citizen. Now, he's there for the purposes of making sure the roads are safe. Uh, that's, his, that's his premise for pulling people over. Did he actually attempt to breath test anyone else? No, he didn't. He, he actually was speaking with me for a couple of minutes. It was then at that time that I pulled out my phone and told him I was gonna record the conversation. Yep. And then you see him in the video, he's waving the traffic behind me on. And okay. He passed on about five, maybe six cars. So the intent of the, the roadside breath test was to make sure that people in their cars on the road were not intoxicated, not endangering other people. Exactly. Yet it seems from this video that he had a preference to stand there and argue a point with you rather than, I mean, look, I can't speak for the police, I'm not a police officer, but one would imagine, you applying a logic, that if someone wants to argue a point and you believe you're justified in having them there on the side of the road, the common sense thing would be to go, listen here, mate, you want to argue with me? You wait there for a second, go and breath test the other people that he's stopped on the road and then come back to you. So obviously that didn't happen and it raises even more questions. Um, so I think that's something for the public to kind of consider about how are these laws applied and how, how, how is policing actually making safer roads if police prefer to argue with someone who questions their authority as opposed to actually try and make the roads safer? Mm. Yeah, look, that's a very good point, Matt. You know, and I can't speak for the copper and his personal opinions as to why he did what he did. Yeah. Um, you know, he has a, a duty of care to follow um, with the people that he pulls over. Um, I was first in line, so therefore he's 
probably more obliged to sit there and talk to me, but as for the reasons why he waved them on, I can't comment for him. Yeah, and that's fair enough. Look, we might uh, reach out to, to you know, a police representative and ask them, you know, what is the thinking behind that? Because I think it's something that, that the people would like to understand. So where we stand now, you totally agree with random breath testing. You think it's important for road safety. Uh, we've covered that. You question the legitimacy of the existing laws, and we look forward to coming to that in the second and or third part of this you know, interview series to bring to the light of day the depth of why this happened on the side of the road. But coming back to right now, you obviously had this um, exchange with the police officer. We note in the footage that at one point in time he said, you're under arrest. Mm. And your response was something along the lines of, you know, am I? Now he seemed to move past that. Mm. Um, and again, from what I understand, later in the court case, he actually said he had no reason to believe that you're intoxicated. Mm. So that, that, that would that be an accurate statement? Yeah, look, that's right, mate. You know, he did say that I was under arrest and then at the end of the video, he proceeded to let me go, you know. Without um, conducting the breath test. Without conducting it. When, it. when it comes down to it, they've got to... The police officers can't just pull anybody over willy-nilly, mate. They've got to have reasonable suspicion. You know, did he see me with a drink in my hand? Was I drinking at the time? Was I swerving across the road? Was I speeding? Was I doing anything to give him a reason to pull me over in the first place? Yeah. And I, I wasn't, and he clearly states that in his statement that went through the court. Okay. So we start to get to kind of getting into what powers do the police have to conduct random breath testing? So there's two styles from my limited understanding, and you might be able to expand on that, and we'll certainly pose it to a police representative if they agree to an interview. But there's two styles of breath testing. There's one where they have reasonable suspicion and they conduct a roadside breath test. The other one is where they set up and do random breath testing. So they don't have any reason to believe people have been drinking. They're just pulling people up randomly and making sure that they're not intoxicated. Sure. So in this situation, this was not a random breath test. There was not a roadside setup, was there? No, well, it was just the one police officer on his own. He had his car parked on the side of the road and he was stopping every car that drove past. So yeah. More than likely, yeah, I would call it random. Okay. Yeah, if you can call it random, you know, he's pulling over every single vehicle, so... Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, look, then this is where we get into the context of the law and how it's supplied, I suppose. Mm. So, look, to, to really kind of finish up on this topic, the other thing that we found really unusual is the footage that you were provided by the police for the case actually starts at the very instant that your video commences. Mm. Now we're of an, uh, of an understanding and we can always stand corrected with everything that we do. This is an exp exploration of the facts. We don't pretend to be an authority on this. Uh, that police officers have their lapel cameras running constantly. Yet the commencement of your exchange and the process of him pulling vehicles over was not provided to you. Do you find that unusual? I do mate. Look I was, I was under the impression that they're Cameras run 24-7 okay. when they're on duty. I Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not 100% on that, but that was my understanding. When when it went through the court and in the police officer's statement, he actually said that, well, you know, Mr. Summers pulled out his mobile phone and started recording, and it was at that time that I operate, I activated my body camera. Um, now, I'd, like I said, I thought that they would be recording 24-7, you know. Yeah. If, some, if something did arise and it was in the heat of the moment, you know, how Do you easy, have time to yeah, turn it on? How easy would it be for an officer just to forget to turn his camera on? Yeah. You know? Well, that's a, and that's another question in itself. Very, very interesting one indeed. And it's something that we look forward to kind of, you know, exploring a little bit more. So for the purposes of today's interview, I just wanted to move across to a couple of the questions. Look, there's a whole lot of conjecture on social media. And a lot of that comes from being ill-informed mm. and actually having the mainstream media's opinion thrust down their throat. And the mainstream media has been very critical of you, mate, and it has a lot of the, a lot of the public. One of the things that I really want to kind of get your your understanding on: people keep bringing up this free man of the land kind of ideology. Now, mm. where where does your understanding? Obviously, this is something that you're passionate about. Where does your understanding of this come, and do, does it relate to free man of the land thinking? Look the. The free man of the land, so they call it, or the, the straw man, whatever you want to call it, is all to do with the name and the license. It's all contract and that sort of thing. Yep. I, I've never once claimed any 
free man of the land or yeah. anything. You know, when I went to court, they they called out my name. They said, "Is Christopher Summers in the corner?" I said, "Yeah, mate, I'm right here." Yes. I stood up and I claimed it. I said, "That's me." So by definition, by that very act, that is proof for the general public that this is not a free man of the land initiative. No, look, I'm That's... not. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to argue that I'm not who I say I am. I'm. I'm Christopher Summers. I'm a living man. Yes. Yeah. When it gets into their definitions that they use of, they're calling me a person. A definition of a person is a corporation. And I tried to explain this to the officer on the side of the road, which yeah. he didn't want to know about it. You know. Yeah. It's. And we get into the semantics of of law and legal process. That's right. Look, the whole thing behind it is I'm not I'm not playing the free man in the land card or anything like that, so to speak. I'm contesting the validity of the law yeah. and the way that they're enacted, and they're not done correctly. Yes. And this is something that obviously from your perspective needs more investigation and it, I would assume it steps outside the bounds of the Torum Act and that kind of thing to a whole range of laws that aren't actually in line with their, our constitutional rights and constitutional law. Look it does you know the when when laws are created <laughs> for the for the people to know that a law has followed due process it has to go through a process and it goes through the lower house the upper house onto the Governor General and then it's given royal assent in the Queen's name and that sort of thing. At the end of it there must be, there's a proclamation certificate they call it and that's what I kept asking this officer for. I'm saying mate show me the proclamation certificate because yep. that proclamation certificate that proves to me as a person of the public that that law has had the proper checks and balances and gone through the way that it should be to be created. Without that proclamation certificate that law is nothing. And that's it's your not right a, It's not even that. a law. That's my right. That's exactly right. You know, look, there's a High Court case in 1943 that says that the interpretation of the law is paramount and it relies on the common man yes. and his interpretation. Yes. Not what the police think. It's what the public thinks. So what this comes back to really is a whole lot of education. Obviously, people are so busy in their lives. They don't have time to, you know, look, obviously you've done a lot of research around this and it's something that you're passionate about. The average person doesn't have the time to do that. But one would imagine that the authorities, the law and the people that police the law actually have an obligation to at least give us the opportunity mm. to have a, a closer, uh, accurate interpretation than just you must do what we say because it's the law without any backing. Exactly, look, I, I don't even think that the police know what their rights and responsibilities are half the time, you know, like the Constitution of Australia is the highest law in the land in Australia. Yep. And we've got a public servant, a police officer, who's upholding the law for the yes. common good of the people. Yep. And he openly stated in the video that he hasn't even read the Constitution. Mm. Now, if someone in a position of power like that, to, to openly state they're not, they haven't read it, that's pretty sad, mate, you know. Well, and you know, you raise a really interesting point because watching the video closely, when when you actually stated that to the officer, and he asked you, "Have you read it?" and you said, "Yes." Yeah. The exchange then went to a demeaning format where he asked you, "Have you read the Reader's Digest version?" Yeah. Well, I think that was a lot to do, you know, with when he said, "Oh, have you read it, mate?" and I said, "Yeah." Well, you know, it's a thousand and eight pages long. Yeah. And I have had a lot of flack from that, you know, like people are saying, "Oh." What version is he reading, you know, because the Constitution's only 64 pages long. Well, I'm actually reading the Quick and Garin, a noted version. Okay. That's what the difference is. Excellent. And I mean, look, that, that's really valuable because the whole purpose of what we're doing here is to try and give the public an understanding of exactly where you're coming from and to try and take away the, uh, I suppose, the attacks on you and give people understanding, okay, 1,008 pages is based on the interpretation of lawyers and people that are passionate about the Constitution mm. and their interpretations of the Constitution itself. That's so right. I think that's a really valuable point. So Chris, look, is there something, we'll, we'll wrap it up here because I wanted, you know, I'm looking forward to doing a couple of other stages of this interview process about the court process, about how it panned out that someone so uh, publicly contesting the validity of the laws and roadside breath testing ultimately receives no loss of license and a $200 fine, totally against the recommendation of the police prosecutor. And that is a whole other realm in itself, and that's why we want to separate it. But for today, about the roadside and that, is there anything else that you wanted to add and kind of tell the public? No, look, I think everything really for now has been said, you know, it's, it's not about 
This is not an attack personally on the police officer or yeah. anything like that. You know, we need police, we need laws. We can't just go running around and have no laws and corruption, all the rest of it, you know. Like, at the end of the case, me and the, me and the police officer, Chris Morrell, we actually shook hands, mate, and I said, look, no, nothing personal, mate. This isn't between, you know, nothing personal against you. And he said, mate, he said, I'm just doing my job as a police officer and you're just doing your job keeping me in check for the people. And yeah. I said, that's exactly right, mate. And, that's and mate, that's is. A, that is a beautiful way to end. Chris, thanks for your time today. We look forward to bringing the public more on this, unmuzzling this topic and unmuzzling you and your journey and your perspective uh, for the you know, for the betterment and the education of the general public. No worries. Thanks very much for having Cheers, me. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, mate. So look, that was fantastic to interview Chris. What we have is Chris's original footage and the footage from the police officer on the day. We're actually going to merge those two so that you, the public, have a very clear audio of both the officer's exchange and Chris's exchange. And we'll release that in a video to follow this one. More to come. Cheers.